see President Robin Steinbach, who is in attendance today. Um, she has enthusiastically supported this event. And um, one of the things that she said uh, recently in a, um, in, in a message reply uh, to this event, she said that she looks forward to the profound experience, stimulating conversation and commitments that will arise from this opportunity to hear from Stephen Newcomb. And I just thought that that was really well put. And so I wanted to share that with you as well. Um, and with that, I would like to say welcome to Mr. Newcomb. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. De La Winsa, Steve Newcomb, Nula Lindam, Eli Pauk, Gisha Lemieng, Kika Yu Yamananinga Ke, Mia Ungunda Walken, Mili Ungunda Walken, Wuli Nepali, Wuli Nipalinan, Wanishi, Kisha Lemieng, Kika Yu Yamananinga Ke. Uh, that's just a short prayer in our Lenape language, and I wanted to thank uh, Larissa and Albert and everyone uh, at Moreno Valley Community College for setting this event up and inviting me to be here with you today, and uh, it's uh, an honor to be with you all, and I reach out to each and every one of you. I um, wanted to uh, begin by setting a context for this conversation today, for this presentation and the Q&A that we will have afterwards. And the context, the way in which I think about that, it, it, in terms of the contrast between the original free and independent existence of our nations and peoples extending back to the beginning of time through our oral histories and traditions, and contrasting that with the system of domination that was brought across the ocean by ship and imposed on everyone and everything. And the way in which I think about a lot of the information that I'll be presenting today is with a view from Turtle Island. In other words, a Turtle Island perspective, some, some of our nations think of what is now called North America as being uh, Turtle Island based on creation stories and so forth. And so that view from the shore of Turtle Island, looking out at the ships coming toward our ancestors, that's what I'm trying to convey. And the contrast between that and the view from the ship coming toward the shore. And when we um, uh, think about that, it, it really does provide the kind of contrast that we need in order to reveal a lot of information, a lot of insights that we wouldn't otherwise have. I also want to remember and acknowledge my friend and mentor, Virgil Kilstrait, with whom I founded the Indigenous Law Institute in 1992. Virgil was an educator, an Oglala Lakota educator from Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And he also was a ceremonial man, a, a headman, a leader and uh, an extraordinary human being. And we lost him in February of 2019. And so I want to say that, uh, you know, without him and his guidance and influence, I wouldn't be where I am today and wouldn't be doing the things that I'm doing today in the way that I am. So I always like to acknowledge him and remember him. The other thing I want to emphasize is the nature of human knowledge because I think everything that we're dealing with in terms of ideas comes from the mind. And that should be rather obvious. My book, Pagans in the Promised Land, deals with cognitive theory or the theory of the human mind and particularly metaphorical systems, uh, different ways in which human beings categorize and classify and, and organize their knowledge systems. and when we think back to the longevity of our nations and peoples existing in this part of the world, going back thousands and thousands of years to use Western European uh, terminology for time, the, um, it's quite extraordinary. Even those few words that I said in Lenape, to the extent that I'm able to speak our language, which is very little uh, for a, a whole number of reasons, 
you're hearing sounds that according to, to the archaeological record go back 13,000 years or more. And down in the Kumeyaay Nation territory, which by the way, I'm in the uh, area of the Tongva, the um, Hashaman, the uh, Chumash, and um, the Gabrieleno and other nations here in the Los Angeles basin. So I want to acknowledge all of those nations as well. But in any case, when you go back down to the Kumeyaay Nation territory, there was a mastodon bone that was found there some years ago, about three decades ago. And when they did the dating on that and realized that there's evidence of humans having worked that bone when it was still fresh, they were astonished because the longevity of that bone, they dated back 120,000 years at least slightly more. So we're talking about a period of time that humans have been here and just, it's quite unbelievable, really. It's extraordinary. But then when we go back to the creation stories and, uh, and understanding the knowledge systems, the more moral frameworks that come out of our traditional teachings and practices and the longevity, as I had said, of our nations and peoples, it's, there's so much to learn from that. And we could go into a bit more of that. Uh, for example, I'll give you one example. Um, the, in the sound law in Lakota, which is uh, the language of my friend Virgil and his people, that sound is indicating deep affection. So pila mia or wopila or tunkashila, those words all have that deep affection embedded in the structure of the word and the structure of the language. So the language itself is designed actually for prayer and deep connection with all the... This but, meeting is being recorded. And the, um, and so that's, that's innate within the language, you might say. And that's just one example. Another example is the Kumeyaay greeting, Hauka which one translation of that word is, may the fire within you burn bright, which acknowledges the life force in each and every human being and wishing positive, um, you know, something positive for the life force or the life of that person. And these are just a few of the metaphorical uh, meanings that you can locate or identify, ascertain within our various languages. And, now, when we switch over to the domination system that I mentioned, and that's really my, my book is about the contrast between the two, but I spend most of the time in the book looking at um, the nature of the domination system and how that originated. And um, it, it goes back to Latin and the Vatican, Vatican documents of the 15th century issued by various popes from four, the 1430s in relation to the Canary Islands, uh, 1436, 1452, 1454, 1455, 1456, uh, 1481, 1493, 1506, and 1514. And each of those documents has a tremendous amount of information in, in Latin, the original Latin, but also the English translation. And I've been studying some of those documents since 1989, and I've realized a lot of information, a lot of insights from that. Now, um, as an example of the domination system, the papal document from 1452 called the Doom Diversus, it says that the is Pope Nicholas V issuing a directive to King Alfonso of Portugal, telling him to go to the western coast of Africa and to invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and to take away all their possessions and property. If you go into each and every one of those terms, and then you look at those terms as a holistic structure and a system that emerges from those terms or is the result of that kind of terminology and the behavior that goes with that terminology, 
you realize that this is something quite horrific. And when you understand that that kind of language was issued by uh, numerous popes and numerous documents over uh, an extremely long period of time, it's quite horrific because that's what hit our nations and peoples when that system was brought over here. And when you go to English common law or to the commissions that were issued to other mariners or voyagers or explorers or whatever colonizers, whatever terminology you want to use, most of those documents from England and France and Portugal and so forth were the royal charters were modeled after this horrific language that we see in those Vatican documents. So um, to get even more specific, when you go to the Vatican papal bulls that were issued, there were four of them issued after Columbus returned to Europe from the, Car from the Bahamas or the Caribbean. The, the, those documents reveal a number of patterns of domination as well. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. The papal bull from May 3rd of 1493, it refers to lands discovered and to be discovered. And then in Latin, it says, que sub actuali dominio temporali alicorum dominorum Christianorum constitute non assent. And what that means is that are not established or constituted under the domination, dominio, of any Christian dominators, dominorum Christianorum. And so what that tells us is that the intention of those voyagers and of those monarchs and so forth that sent the voyagers out across the ocean was to identify or locate those places on the planet that had not been forced under the domination system of the Christian empire. And in the papal document of May 4th, 1493, the Interstera papal bull of that uh, date, you find the uh, idea that uh, one part of it says, we have confidence or trust in him with a capital H on him from whom empires and dominations and all good things proceed. So this envisions empire and domination emerging from the deity with the capital H on there. The, that's how you know that him refers to the deity of the Catholic church and that, uh, the, that the Christian empire that the Pope, Pope Alexander VI wants to have propagated, uh, Imperii Christiani Propagationum, is emerging from that deity. So it's quite extraordinary to go into those documents and understand a lot of these kinds of, inf you know, this type of information. Uh, but this wasn't overnight. I've been at this a very, very long time. And just through sheer determination and, and um, you know, a, a great amount of anger that I had as a young person trying to understand what had happened to our people, what had happened to all of our nations, and why was it that we didn't have our, our language and, and our culture and our traditions to the extent that we should and, and our lands and so forth, our way of life you know, how do we make sense of all that? So this journey that I've been on is, has been an effort to make sense of my own identity, to make sense of my own life and to heal basically, because that's what each and every one of us, I believe is dealing with the issue of how do we heal? How do we come together? How do we communicate in a respectful and effective manner? How do we listen deeply and uh, from the heart, and and what does all that mean? And my friend Joe De Gaudi, um, who was chairman at the Yakima Nation, he spends a lot of time discussing identity and and identity. Who who are we? Where do we come from? Uh, you know, all those things that have to do with making sense of our own identity in the world and in community with others. He's just an extraordinary human being in that regard. And we have a lot of those kinds of conversations. So I think this is the, the real effort that we're involved in. The profound friends that I have, and I say profound because they're 
all of them are basically very deep thinkers and we have these amazing conversations and it's all about trying to make sense of it of of what has happened and the wreckage that was left behind but then you know we can't stay in that kind of a condition so we have to do our level best to make sense of it all and to enter on enter a path or embark upon a path of uh, positivity and healing and and so forth but at the same time the negative is there the system of domination that was put in place continues to be in place and it hasn't gone anywhere and is not going anywhere because the people that want to maintain that system are still maintaining it so it's kind of uh, this is where we could get into a little bit of nuance and subtlety in terms of the usual and accustomed terminology. You hear people use terms like uh, uh, reconciliation. And I'm a big proponent of taking words like that, usual and accustomed words and breaking them down, breaking them apart and looking at what's in the deeper structure of the word and what does that reveal. So as an example, if uh, my wife Paige and I have a falling out and, um, and maybe we separate and so forth, well, we had a beneficial relationship to begin with, so we have something to reconcile. We could talk about a reconciliation if we chose to use that word. But if you have nations and peoples that don't have and didn't have and never had a beneficial relationship with the domination system, how in the world do you do you create a reconciliation on that basis? It makes absolutely no sense. And yet that's a kind of a trap word that's being used up in Canada with regard to if you have a people who claim that they have a crown that is the, in the very highest position with an assumed sovereignty and some of that other terminology of domination, and they're inviting you to reconcile yourself to their claim of a right of superiority, the only way you can do that is by tacitly or explicitly accepting their position or their claim, claimed position. I don't think, think it is an actual position, but a claimed position of superiority or of dominance or of domination. And so that's why I say it's a trap. So um, I think going into English and looking at it in a very detailed way is very helpful in terms of what I already mentioned with regard to human knowledge. How do we know what we know or what we believe we know? And how do we verify whether what we, we believe to be true is actually true? What, what, how, what's the process uh, by which we can go about making those inquiries? And then also, how do we come together in a way that uh, uh, actually allows people to express their views, even if those views are views we may vehemently disagree with, but nonetheless, that people have the, the right and the, and the um, um, prerogative, maybe I'm not sure that's the right word, but certainly have the right to express their views. And I think this whole business of suppression of information, this um, uh, idea that people should be silenced and suppressed and not allowed to speak. That's uh, inquisition, mid medieval kind of um, behavior toward those uh, that some people don't want to, um, you know, they just don't want them to be able to express their views. And I see a very dangerous trend in that direction, almost moving toward what some might call a, a dark ages, uh, a, a neo-feudalism or neo-medievalism in terms of um, those draconian measures that are being put into place to suppress and silence people. So uh, the, other, the other thing is that we, if we were to look at the nature, especially in California and especially in the Riverside area there where, where the Moreno Community College is and the, the extent to which the theme of the California mission system is celebrated there. If we look at the actual nature of that mission system, as it's called, and try to identify the mission of that mission system, what, how would we go about identifying that mission statement? I've already alluded to a lot of that in terms of the Vatican papal documents that 
were behind that whole mission missionization effort by Junipero Serra and uh, Gaspar de Portola and all those other uh, personalities that that came to uh, this part of the world back in the 1760s and late 1760s and so forth. But the other part of it would be to go to the Bible, the basis of missionization and the missionary movement. And for some people, this might be actually controversial or they might not appreciate this examination of the uh, scriptures and so forth. But that's partly what my book is about as well, uh, primarily focused on the Old Testament and some of the more um, challenging and, and uh, horrific um, narratives in the Old Testament having to do with the Canaanites and Moabites and Hittites and Amorites and so forth, and the uh, war waged against those nations and peoples, and the way that that analogy of the chosen people in the promised land was applied to this part of the planet by the effort to colonize and um, engage in empire building here in this part of the world. But in any case, when you go to Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, <clears throat> which the Vatican, as an example, I think the whole Christian world considers that to be the basis of missionization. And it has a quote attributed to Jesus, where he is uh, saying that all power, or another translation is all authority, has been given him and go therefore and make disciples of all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So then as I examined that, I began to wonder, well, what is this word for power or authority in Latin? Because the Vulgate Bible of, the, of Latin of the Catholic Church, there there's a specific Latin wording in there, obviously. So when I went and looked at that, it revealed that the word was potestas, P-O-T-E-S-T-A-S, potestas. And that basically means power, authority, sovereignty, sway, all the rule, all those types of terms. But it also went to other Latin terms such as D-I-C-I-O and D-I-T-I-O. And what that revealed was a meaning of to reduce to subjection a country to oneself. Or we could say, though, you know, we could add the word force in there to forcibly reduce to subjection a country to oneself. And that's just an amazing um, revelation to me, uh, to use a kind of a, a biblical term, um, because what it it's consistent with the way in which that mission system assaulted and abused and destroyed so many uh, native people within California and elsewhere in the world. You know, um, it, it just, it's really quite extraordinary to get into a lot of this kind of detail. Now a Christian uh, I think would probably not agree with that particular interpretation that I just gave you. I have a friend uh, who was a Franciscan and stepped away from that after uh, a long period of time. And, but he still has friends in the Franciscan order. And he asked one of them about that very specific area of the Bible. And his friend took that back. In fact, his friend teaches theology to the Franciscans. And he took that particular passage back to exousia in Greek, E X O U. S-I-A, exousia, and he said that this was basically interpreted as a healing power. So yeah, he says all power, but all healing power has been given me. Uh, and, and so, okay, we can theorize about that. But if that's the case, then why would you have as just one example at the Santa Cruz mission, a priest who not only whipped uh, native people almost to death in a couple of cases with the cat and nine tails, but then put these sharp metal objects, these sharp little metal balls with spikes coming out of them at the end of those nine lashes of the whip and use that to brutalize people. 
and so many other instances that we can think of or cite of, of horrific treatment of uh, uh, men and women and children, so forth. So if that's healing power of Jesus, then there's something radically wrong. Obviously, it's not. And so now when I say all these things for anyone that is a Christian person that might be listening to me, I'm not saying these things to attack uh, anyone's personal belief, uh, whatever someone wants to believe in. And if that gives a person um, support in their life and, and a sense of grounding and purpose, that's not for me to question. But I do have to go back and look very um specifically at all these different aspects of the history and the written historical record in order to arrive at some sense of accuracy and um, hopefully a deep sense of accuracy. So, uh, I mean, I could go on uh, longer, but I don't know if um, this might be a good time to, to stop and do some question and answer. Uh, I, I guess I should mention something about the native folks that native uh, nation representatives that went over to the Vatican and just got back. And um, that had to do with the residential schools and the deaths of so many children in those residential schools, uh, thousands and thousands of children and uh, the abuse and horrific suffering that they went through. Um, and so that was over the course of generations as a, in an effort by the Catholic church, the nuns and priests and by the Canadian government to destroy the languages, cultures and spiritual traditions of our nations and peoples. And of course you had the same phenomenon here in the United States with the boarding schools. My grandfather Solomon Newcomb and, um, excuse me, my great grandfather Solomon Newcomb and my grandfather Bushy had spy book Newcomb, both ended up at Haskell boarding school. So we do have an understanding of, of the um, terrible nature of, of that in terms of our own family history and, and the um, kinds of dysfunction that that creates. It's a ripple effect that goes for generations and generations. In any case, this uh, First Nations delegation went there to the Vatican and over the course of the week, they met with Pope Francis and they uh, got to tell him uh, some of the horrible experiences and suffering that many of them went through and personally and that their relatives have gone through. And, um, and then on April 1st, this past Friday, Pope Francis made a rather lengthy statement and uh, issued an apology um, and begged God for forgiveness. I don't know what that was supposed to accomplish, because if God forgives the church and the Pope, I don't know how that's how that benefits any survivors of the residential schools. But that's um, that's just my own kind of observation about the strange nature of of his uh, presentation in, in a lot of ways. I will say that I have, and not just me, but others over the course of decades, we have presented a lot of this information about the domination system to the Catholic Church, about the Vatican papal documents, and they're very well aware of it. We've had correspondence with them and, and dialogue and discussion with uh, members of the hierarchy all the way up to cardinals and archbishops and bishops and, and um, met the Pope in 2016 and gave him a copy of my book along with a larger a uh, document that we had created as the delegation there. And um, he said he would read the book. I don't know if that ever happened, but um, in any case, the, the, here was the perfect opportunity for them, for the Vatican and the Pope to acknowledge what we have been saying for decades about these Vatican documents that caused so much destruction and devastation and death on the planet, and they declined to do so. So it was their perfect opportunity, but they're gonna to continue to sidestep the issue and pretend that, they, that they're that they unaware, but they're fully aware. And uh, so we will continue and press, press ahead. 
the Pope is supposed to come to Canada at some point in the future. And um, so we'll see if that happens. And maybe if that does, then I'll go on up there as well. But um, in any case, let me go ahead and stop there, pause for a little bit and see if anyone has any feedback or questions. And, and um, I look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, um, for your for your overview of the work that you're doing. And um, I know there's just so much; it's really hard to distill it down to this uh, short time frame that we have here. Now, I think that everybody's been listening hard and and thinking hard about everything. Um, so I don't have any questions in the in the chat. So I'm just wondering if if anybody has any questions or comments or anything that they would like to um, to bring up at this point. Yes. I do. Um, number one, I'm Canadian, sir, and I apologize for the Canadian government and for what's happened to the First Nation people. Have you ever thought about using the Holocaust precedents for reparations? Um, I, I think that could work in the legal system to go after the Catholic Church, um, not only looking for apology, um, but reparations perhaps in what they do in the schools there because the Indian reservations and in, for Canada, they're still dreadful places. Um, but I, I think it could be a fascinating question to use Holocaust precedence for uh, reparations from the Catholic church. Um, also memory, your thing in memory, I use an exercise in class where I tell the students, I'm gonna change your name today, Stephen, you're going to be David today. And when you go home, you're not going to know how to get home. So who are you? Who are you? And that's what you're talking about. Cognition and memory is so significant because if you reclassify everything, every tree, bird, your name, you have no identity. And the most powerful thing we know about First Nation people is they were so connected to the world, everything was sacred, your name um, standing there. I mean, you weren't named Henry Miller because you milled the fields or George Farmer. You were connected to the very earth and nature. And that's so profound in terms of identity. Um, so I really appreciate your conversation about memory. It really struck a chord with me. So mm. I apologize for going on, really oh. very powerful. That's, uh, that's fine, that's fine. Well, I don't, I don't know about the, um, specifically about the Holocaust. I mean, the American Holocaust, the, the book by David Standard does mm -hmm. a great job of, of explaining why that word is very applicable to this entire hemisphere, the Western, so-called Western hemisphere, because it's West of Europe. But, um, uh, but all of those kinds of analogies are powerful and they have their own particular strength lack thereof just it just depends on how you want to extend that and apply that okay so there have been efforts to talk about financial reparations but whenever I hear that word reparations I understand that it also goes back to repair so how do you repair a language that has been through all these policies basically uh, destroyed in terms of people that actually speak speak the language as a living language and where the infants are that are born are born into that language and are able to speak the language as toddlers and as they grow to adulthood and the primary language acquisition years up to about 12 or so that they're learning in their own language and so this is the crime that the amazing horrific crime that was committed by all of these colonial and imperial institutions mm -hmm. to destroy languages that have been existing and evolved for thousands and thousands of years and with no regard to what they were destroying, the language, the knowledge systems and so forth, the concepts, they just, just went ahead and destroyed it because they could. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's just, it's, but a part of this has to do with the extent to which the masses of people are oblivious and completely unaware of the magnitude of what we're talking about and the horrific nature of it. So um, I think, you know, I, th I commend you for 
uh, uh, attempting to help the students to become more aware and cognizant of these kinds of issues. And it isn't necessarily the case that they won't have any identity if suddenly their name is, uh, you know, Antonio or whatever the heck it might be, uh, Jose or some, some Spanish name, for example, um, or wh whatever name it might be, if they're imposing it from another language system and another culture, the nature of the way metaphor works to create and sustain reality is that they will end up with that colonial identity and uh, the part of the colonial uh, domination mm -hmm. process. And, and I like to give the analogy that if you take that initial island that Columbus traveled to, that he invaded, which the Taino people called Guanahani. And then suddenly he puts the name San Salvador on their holy savior in Spanish. Well, it's not just those two words. It's the entire universe of meaning that goes with those two words, that those two words are carriers mm -hmm. of that universe of meaning. And that's called a metonymy or a synecdoche, the part that stands for the whole. And this is part of the whole reality construction process. Once that term San Salvador is merged in the human mind with that island, try extricating it from the island and separating them back out. Very difficult to do, whether it's Riverside or San Diego or Los Angeles or any of these types of names that have been projected onto and superimposed onto the lands and territories of the original nations of, of the entire hemisphere. This is part of the imperial process of creating and maintaining reality and, and imposed reality. So then the challenge for those of us that care to take it on happens to be, how do we respond? What are, the, what are some of the ideas and arguments that we're able to create and to use in order to advocate powerfully on behalf of our nations and people, on the behalf of our languages, and cultures, and spiritual traditions, and so forth, and our sacred places, and and so forth, right? Um, it and so this, I, I think, this issue of how reality gets created and maintained over time but the basis upon which that reality construction process is taking place is critically important. And I feel kind of bad for the average everyday person because the, it seems to me that the indoctrination process of what's called education to some extent, or even to a great extent, uh, hides and uh, obfuscates and occludes uh, the deeper insights and understandings. So a lot of terms are just taken for granted. They just sound like ordinary terms like civilization. Well, if you're looking from the shore out toward those ships and you think about, you ask the question, how do I understand this word civilization? And then you, when you look, then you find the definition, which I did, the forcing of a cultural pattern on a population to which it is foreign that's domination. And so what I, what I identified is seven main terms of domination. Actually, I have 21, but seven, civilization, state, sovereignty, ascendancy, dominion, property, and empire. And when you take each and every one of those terms, and I can, I can go through that with folks to identify that each and every one of them goes back to the theme of domination. And so state, is, as Max Weber said very famously, is a relation of men dominating men. If the state is to exist, the dominated must sub subject themselves to the authority claimed by the powers that be. That's a domination system. In fact, he said the modern state is the organization of domination. And that's just one example. And in and I didn't even go into the Johnson versus McIntosh decision of 1823 in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court and federal Indian law, which is the quote unquote legal system that is used against our nations and peoples. But in that particular decision, which, by the way, next year will be the 200 year mark since that decision was issued. Chief Justice John Marshall says in that decision, the character and religion of the continent's inhabitants 
afforded an apology for considering them as a people over whom the superior genius of Europe might claim an ascendancy. And so then when you look up the word ascendancy, that means controlling influence, governing power, domination. It's one of the few words in the dictionary that actually has domination listed in the, in the definition. And so what does that mean? Well, it's the character and religion on the basis of the religion of the original inhabitants, the colonizers were able to assume unto themselves that they had a superior genius that they could use against the, uh, or system of domination that they could use against the original inhabitants. That's the supreme law of the land in the United States today. So it's, it's just an extraordinary thing that they've managed to get away with this, uh, to use that as the foundation or the cornerstone of their whole system of meaning. And the average lawyer will not say what I'm saying because they don't have any reason to. If it's not for their client or for a case they're working on, you know, they're not going to bother with it. But in any case, going back to those seven terms of domination, property is not the material object itself, but the right of domination uh, rightfully obtained over that object. So, you know, I, in a way, I can go through all those terms and there are seven, seven times domination is being repeated, but the average everyday person doesn't, doesn't have any awareness of that at all. So here's the question that I have. If you have a system that's premised upon domination, is it actually a democracy? Or is it something else? Is it, and what does it mean to say that it's a system of domination? And, and so there are a lot of questions that have not yet adequately been raised. And why is it that so much of life on planet Earth is organized around the theme of domination? and the behaviors of domination and dehumanization. And what are we gonna do about that? So the educational system, to, I mean, to a great extent, there are those of you that are uh, working on explaining colonization and that sort of thing. But unless the word domination is actually being used, which it seldom if ever is, um, unless that word is actually being used and looking at the implications of what I'm saying, then it continues to be out of view and out of sight. And so the, the deeper implications of that cannot be raised until that becomes an issue. There's a fabulous book, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's by Richard Harvey Brown, uh, published in 1977, I believe, called A Poetic for Sociology. It's such an extraordinary book. I've been reading it for uh, a couple decades. I read it over and over. And he has this profound statement in there. He, he says that the thing itself, whatever that thing might be, the thing itself emerges or becomes emergent in the process of being named. So what, what that means is that if, if um, once a name is uttered and utilized and comes into focus, then the human mind can obviously focus on it. If we're talking about oranges, and we go to get into all this detail about oranges and suddenly, you, you know, one of us switches over to apples, then just as quick as could be lightning fast, oranges can go right out of the, right out of the picture. And suddenly we're onto a different topic. That seems just almost so simplistic. Like, why does it merit any mention at all? But it's such a key point because when we were working in the international arena on international documents, and with regard to indigenous nations and peoples, the wordsmiths in the UN system, the state actors, the representatives of state governments, they're very cognizant that one comma, one apostrophe, one S, any little slight, the slightest little nuance in language creates the basis for a different kind of reality. And it's really a competition over how is reality going to be organized and, and created and maintained over time. That's what the debate is about. So that's why they were opposed to putting the letter S at the end of the word people, because then you have peoples. And if you have many different peoples, then you have many different nations. 
and there are political implications with that. So the, if the apostrophe goes after the letter S, then that's referring to many different peoples and that which is in some possessive, so that which belongs to those peoples. But if the apostrophe is before the S, then it's individuals. And so then it's about the individuals, the peoples, meaning the individual's possession, whatever that might be. So these are the kind of subtleties that uh, the average person might not have come across and are very um, critically important to any educational process. Do we have any other questions or comments? I just want to say thank you. That was excellent. My cousin also worked on the Rwanda genocide trials. Maybe we can pull him into this. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, thank you for that. That, that that's, uh, in, that's an interesting prospect. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. This is excellent. This whole meaning of language um, it is really, I'm very appreciative of this. I'm so glad that you're here. So. Well, thank you. No, thank, thank you. you. Okay. So thank you, Gerarda. Um, does anybody else have any questions? They can be comments too. For comments? I love debate. Anybody want to challenge me to do that too? It, it appears that, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, Mark, you, you first, please. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I teach communication studies and we talk about, um, you know, denotative and connotative meaning, sapir warp hypothesis, and just how we develop meanings. And I, I really appreciate um, you coming to speak. Uh, I, I try to listen openly, but I, I tend to focus in on my discipline when I attend these types sure. of events. And um, I, I am excited to get your book. I heard there's what, free ones at the dean's office, <laughs> maybe? Um, and uh, I am very excited, not that I don't wanna pay for a book and support you, <laughs> I should preface that, but I, I'm very excited to incorporate this into the uh, language chapter or topic that I uh, teach in each of my classes. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of good stuff here. I just wanna say I appreciate you coming to speak to us. Well, thank you. My, my educational background is in rhetoric and communication. So yeah. I I identify with what you're saying. So. All right. And I, I think, um, Jennifer, you're right. Uh, all of us uh, academics start thinking through the lens of our discipline and how it can be applied. So um, I, I, I'm doing the same thing. I'm taking notes as we're going along here. Uh, Mark, I know that you had a comment or question. Well, I was, I was just um, wondering just with the the headlines now that we're you know starting to see um, the the uh, eminence of um, boy I should work this out before I lay it out but uh, the eminence of, of the climate change consequences and so forth and and that we all are going to need to be focusing on and I'm thinking there's a great gift for the from the the uh first nations and that's probably not a correct term either uh because it in, incorporates you know a modern uh term for something that it, you know was preceded it but um uh, that you know the, the the peoples that had an intimate relationship with more intimate relationship with the nature that sustains the life of that we seek to, uh, you know, extend on the on the planet, and whereas it we it, it, it civilized and industrialized and so forth have separated ourselves and in, intentionally uh, in many cases from those understandings that that might be a vector of relevance that uh, would be undeniable given the the current. Uh, imperatives towards uh, addressing our current uh, dysfunctional way of, of using our resources. Well, thank you for that. What discipline do you teach? Uh, sociology. Oh, terrific. So uh, 
Peter Berger and all that, I cut my teeth on a lot of that kind of information back in the day, you know. But, um, uh, yeah, I think that um, <clears throat> that's a, a excellent point. I guess one of the concerns that I have is that in the name of whether it be a health crisis or an eco crisis, ecological crisis or a climate change crisis, that the domination system is able to intensify and there are those forces that love nothing more than it's sort of like the uh, shock doctrine uh, by Naomi Klein, right? Uh, the idea that if you have a crisis that you can um, make massive uh, financial gains on the basis of that and, and uh, increase the, the levers of control and, and power and so forth. And, um, and I think that that's, that's one of the things that I'm alarmed by, that certainly we need to see reforms, but I'm, um, I'm very disenchanted with the way in which uh, speeches are said, speech is being suppressed and, and uh, human liberties are being suppressed. And, and yet these, uh, you know, massive billionaires are, you know, they, they're, the, they're the billionaires with their massive fortunes, I should say. Uh, you know, 493 new billionaires created during the time of the pandemic. That's very interesting, isn't it? And um, so, yeah, you're right. We need to look at those issues of climate and, and so forth uh, because they are very pressing issues. <clears throat> at the same time, if that provides a justification for intensifying the nature of the domination system and how it manifests, yeah. then we're, we're in a worse predicament than, than we would otherwise be. Yeah, that the but that little caveat is important, you know. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate that the people that are in power and responsible for leading us away from the precipice are so deeply embedded in the processes that impe that in that in impel us towards it that uh, it's going to uh, it's 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 difficult to see how that leadership will be capable of of uh, you know veering away. Uh, from the direction that they owe their prominence to, you know, so uh, it's. Well, I don't know if you're familiar with the term double bind, you know, Gregory yeah. term, uh, which is a, just a, an a fascinating concept that uh, damned if you do and damned if you don't. And so, um, you know, or do this, why do that? do this why'd you do that and then the you know you either way either direction you try to go you're 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 wrong and so uh it, it's a very interesting predicament that the domination system as i call it or the system of domination has brought everyone to this point and now um the the it seems that the there are certain powers that be that have um plans on the horizon i mean if i was going to get deep into it i would go take it all the way back to the reagan administration and operation garden plot and and um all you know for that matter the jfk assassination and what ha happened with the cover-up of that uh, oliver stone stone has come out with a couple of um uh, well, four hours of additional uh, documentary information, JFK dynasty, not dynasty, destiny um, denied, I think it is. It's just extraordinary. So you look at all these patterns of the people behind the scenes, so to speak, that have been orchestrating things since we were quite young. You know, I was eight years old when JFK was assassinated. And you look at the way in which all of these powerful influences have been creating meaning in a way that benefits them and the powers that be and disenfranchises, disempowers and uh, destroys our nations and peoples. And so how do we correct that? And if those are patterns of domination, then how do we correct that? And I certainly don't think it's through the suppression of information, but it seems to me that it has to be through the dissemination of information and the vetting of information and the discussion of information, you know. And I think probably, you know, just right off the bat, we have to worry about population 
And so information and birth control and giving women control of their families is and their family size. I mean, we just because we need I mean, an argument could be made that we need the way that the powers that be have arranged things just in order to, to, to just administrate the massive populations that are, you know, the, acting now like an invasive species. It's just overrunning. Uh, uh, yeah, but it's, in, it's so, I mean, let's, let's examine that for just a moment. Okay. Interesting that population you know, population control, population explore, all, you know, there's those, those discussions have been going on for decades, obviously, but never the domination, never the pattern of domination. Well, and, originally male though. Well, what I'm, yeah, what, whatever, whatever type of domination we're talking about, but what I guess I'm getting at is it's not, it's not the popu it's not the result of population that the billionaires have exploited the hell out of the planet and destroyed ecosystems and that the domination system has destroyed all these ecosystems and created all the devastation and destruction. You know, I was at this uh, nuclear power um, event. It, well, it was an anti-nuclear event, but organized by my friend Ian Zabarti from the, the Western Shoshone Nation. And he likes to allow a lot of different viewpoints to come in. So he had a a pro nuclear power person in there, and, um, <laughs> and you know when when he's uh, talking about how uh, the economics of nuclear power, I, I just asked. I said, "Well, now, did you factor in the uh, with regard to the economics of it, the lives of all those miners that were allowed to mine uranium on the Navajo and reservation and elsewhere?" Um, without the proper kinds of ventilation and protective equipment and so forth uh, and their lives. Is that part of the, the, you know, the way in which you're calculating costs or how about what it's going to cost to clean up the mill tailings from the desert sands that's blowing all through the air and poisoning people or the amount of money it's going to cost to take that radiation and clean that up from the Hanford nuclear facility when it's leaking out of 55 gallon drums into the groundwater and into the Columbia River and into the fish. Have you calculated that? Uh, you know, what it's going to cost to do that? And I said, well, uh, excuse me, I just realized there is no way to clean that up. So I guess you can't possibly calculate that cost. And it's this kind of way in which people are only taking into consideration a fraction of the viewpoint rather than a more comprehensive viewpoint. And um, I think that applies to all these different issues. Not saying that, that population is not a, uh, an important factor, it certainly is, but the way in which the planet and scale and the economics of everything, the ways the, the way in which the economic system is currently organized at, with such devastation and destruction, always with that money flowing up to the, to the, the uh, most powerful economic class is, is, a, is a very real factor that I think doesn't get adequately factored into, into the mix, you know. Okay. Uh, listen, we can I just here. ask one more question, oh, Lisa? Gerard, please. We are. Oh, yeah. We are. We are. Asking, one, I'm, okay. I just want to say, uh, sir, what do you yep. think about uh, a venue like Truth and Reconciliation, the way that they did in South Africa? Um, I think it doesn't work. As I already mentioned, that uh, true. It's a. <laughs> I, I consider that to be a truth and lie commission because the word reconciliation is not applicable if you're going to be accurate. I think we have to look at some other format for that. That's my own personal view. But we could have a longer conversation about that later. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I guess we're probably out of time by now. Yeah, unfortunately, we are. We're five minutes past. And, um, I'm, you know, we have people who have to go to other classes and things like yeah. that. But but listen, everybody, um, I know there, the, all of these, these topics we can talk so much more about. There's so much more to share. And so luckily for you, in two weeks, on um, April 19th, from 5 to 7 p.m., we have a, a documentary screening of um, the Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking the Domination Code. 
And then we'll have a, an hour of time after that for discussion of the film, for more questions, comments. So I know that some of you have more things that you really wanna talk about. And I, I had some questions I wanted to ask as well. So I will save them for that day. Um, I need to announce really quickly that the books that will be provided to you are going to be um, placed in your mailboxes or, or sent out for delivery. Um, do not go to Dean Ree's office looking for them. <laughs> Jennifer Florky. Yeah, don't go, don't go looking for them. We will make sure that you get copies of those. Um, and um, thank you so much, Stephen, for your time today. I think well, thank you. We've learned really so much. Yeah, we've learned so much. And I think that we all have some takeaways that we can take into our classrooms and um, a, just a lot to think about, a lot to think about, and there's a lot to do. So um, we appreciate the, some of the framework and the explanations that you've given to us. And I look, right. I look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Thank you. Monishi. Okay. And people are all clapping now. They're all muted, but. <laughs> no, no. April 19th. <laughs> April 19th. Okay. Yes. And I'll send out, I'll send out okay. a thing to advertise. Okay. Thanks so much. Yes. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All. Okay, it will be the same Zoom link, but I will uh, I will make sure that you all know about it right before it starts. Um, okay, and thank you. Okay, yeah, some good. Thank good, you. Yeah, some nice commentary here. Great presentation. Thank you, Maria. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Um, I'll just hang around here for a few more minutes if anybody else has anything. I see here a comment. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Newcomb, and everyone else that spoke. So much inf uh, interesting information. Okay, so we'll hang out here for a little bit more in case anybody has a question. But I'm going to go ahead and and let you all go to your classes and other meetings and things. Thank you so much. Just wanted to say I'm still gonna go to Ree's okay. office. Can okay. you just deliver <laughs> mine there? Just stop by. <laughs> all right, see you. Thanks, right. Clarissa. All right, you're welcome, thank you. The recording has stopped. I'll stop recording now. So okay. No, this has been so prevalent. I mean, so on my.